We're chasing after stuff that will never, ever satisfy. The Bible says there is a hole in our lives that we will try to fill and more than ever in the history of man, and it's scaring me to death when it comes to this generation, especially my children's generation, the level of discontentment in our lives is staggering. We think we're content until we go to the mall. I think I'm content with the car I drive until I turn on the TV. This is Jim Caldwell. Come on down here to Jeep Yard Hill Dodge and buy a big... I didn't know I needed a car. I'm content, right, until I get on a pontoon boat and I go travel down the lake and I see all those homes on the lake shore and I look at my wife and I'm like, we live in, we live in squalor. Oh my God, look at that. I'm content with my life until I see somebody else's life. And that's what we do. We chase after our culture today more than ever, ever before. And the 50s was the same. It really is all relative when you think about where we are and all the blessings we have at our fingertips. Everything that we have, it, we should be the most blessed people. We, we should be the most grateful people. Everything. We have every kind of technological piece of everything that we can possibly think of. We have all the entertainment up the wazoo. I mean, we have everything at our fingertips 24-7. We are like over, I mean, we're overstimulated. I mean, you name it, we've got it all around us. And we are the most discontent people alive. Nothing makes us happy. Not, not the new car, not the new house. Nothing makes us happy. In the 50s, it was the same, and it's, but today it's just all relative. Think of it this, and a lot of people said, this is why I want to go back to the 50s. A brand new home in the 50s was $8,500. You could buy a brand spanking new home for $8,500. A gallon of gas was 19 cents in the 50s. You could buy a brand new car for Thunderbird for around $1,300. As a matter of fact, in 1957, you could buy the tricked out Corvette. You could buy the Mac Daddy car for $3,300. Brand spanking new off the showroom floor. Uh, I wrote some things down, and it's, it's kind of funny because you start really thinking about what, where, where we've come. A loaf of bread was 16 cents. Uh, a pound of bacon was 52 cents. I'm going to talk Southern today because yesterday on the History Channel I watched You Don't Know Dixie. Did anybody see that show? We're American by birth, but we're Southern by the grace of God. So, I mean, it's just, I don't know why I would say that. Um, baby diapers, this seems like a lot. Um, $2.79 for cloth baby diapers. Ugh. Here, honey. Um, uh, one carat diamond ring was $299, 300 bucks. And you go, I'm only back in the 60s or 50s. Or I went, well, the average income was $3,500 a year. And you go, well, that's what I make now. Um, for most of us, for most, for most of us, we make more than that. And really, it's about the same. Do you think about it? It's pretty much triple. An average home today is about triple the annual salary in America today. It's all relative. And we have so many advances, so many things that people have invented and strive for and spent their whole lives that you and I might find, quote, contentment in life. We might be just satisfied with our experiences, yet we're the most discontent people alive. And if you really think about it, I know I'm weird, but put it in perspective this way. Think about how much better off we are than so many wealthy dead people. I mean, think about it, right? I mean... The wealthiest of people in days gone by were destitute compared to us. Alexander the Great. The guy, had, he was loaded. Had all kinds of money. But I guarantee you this, he could not buy dog food in bulk because he had not a Sam's Club card on him. <laughs> right? Napoleon. Napoleon had, I mean, he was wealthy. But he did not have direct TV with the NFL Sunday ticket. I promise you. You think about all the stuff that we have, but you're like, Brent, you're like, that's so stupid. We don't compare ourselves with dead people. We compare ourselves with the Joneses, the next door neighbor. And you start thinking about all that we have in our society, the blessing that we have in the, in the great community in which we live. And you know what? We should be grateful that we just don't have the bubonic plague anymore. But no, we need a hot tub too. I mean, it's like, it's amazing. <laughs> to th think about where we are. And you know what? It's amazing because I think through the eras, started with the television more than ever before, Satan is in the corner applauding every single person who is chasing after temporary dreams, 
temporary goals, trying to be satisfied with the latest and greatest relationship, possession. Because I think a lot of us, here's the struggle, a lot of us, it's not just what we buy at the mall. A lot of us are so discontent today, we're ready to pack it in and move on to the next significant other because they just don't do it for us anymore. We're, we're chasing after this hole in our heart that we're trying to fill with stuff. And so we have a family that was here Wednesday night in church, a friend of mine. I talked to him before the service or the last few weeks about this particular topic. I talked to him after the day after that. And he's like, Brent, you hit me. If, if you didn't get anybody else, you know what? I'm going to start looking at my life completely different because I'm looking at the latest and greatest. I have to have that car. I have to have that home. And all the while, I'm taking my family into an avalanche of debt. My wife looks at me like, please stop. We're, 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 on the, we're on the brink of destruction. I got a communication card from their little boy in church several months ago that said, please pray for mommy and daddy. All they do is fight over bills all the time. All the while, we feel worse about ourselves because of the debt. So what do we do? We go get some more debt and head to the mall because it makes us feel better for 10 minutes. The new car smell, right, goes away. And it's funny because it, the... The world has, been this, has this same problem forever. King Solomon, Ecclesiastes, we'll start there this morning in your Bible. Chapter 5, verse 10, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10 says this. And it's pretty, pretty interesting. Solomon, who researched and experimented on the subject of more possessions and more money do not bring contentment, says this. Ecclesiastes 5. Some of y'all need to hear this this morning. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. Whoever loves money never has enough. Remember the uh, movie Wall Street, Money Never Sleeps? The one younger, young, young character dude that was trying to be a protege by Michael Douglas' character, he, he looked at one of his friends, he goes, what's your number? What's your number? He goes, what do you mean? Because what's your number that you would have to have in your bank account? To think everything is going to be good and you can walk away from the rat race. What's your number? Everybody tends to have a number. What's yours? When all of a sudden, they, this character looked back at him and said, my number is more. What's happening today, and this is why I want to talk to you about this particular virtue this week. And, and my life is very prone to this. That we are chasing after what the world calls success. Only to never satisfy us. And to be, be destroyed around us. There are people in this room that you're in the throes right now. Uh, and, I, and I've talked to several of you exactly about this exact subject. You have a job opportunity. Which could take your income from here to here. You're okay where you're at. You can feed your family, pay your bills. You spend time with your wife and your children. You can help coach. You can do some different things. You can be engaged in their life. But right now, you have an opportunity to jump to the next level. That means it's going to be a, probably 50 more hours a week. You're going to be obsessed with work. You're going to be married to it. But you're going to be able to take your family to a whole other level of financial what a Shangri-La. And you think, well, maybe I should do that because that's just kind of what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to chase that almighty dollar. But what's going to happen is you're going to lose the engagement in your home because of all of that time. Your, your life won't be balanced. It's amazing how many conversations I have with guys in this room about that particular subject. Because, well, Brent, I'm not really content with what I make right now. Um, if I could just make a, a little bit more, then I, I would be content. You realize that not a Christian survey, but just a US, U.S. and World Report survey a couple of years ago asked Americans this question. In your mind, um, what, what would it take for you to really have the American dream and be content and really say, I could live out my life th in this particular way? Those that made $25,000 a year, all of them pretty much straight up said, if I could just make fifty to $60,000 a year, I would be, that, that'd be, I mean, I'm, <laughs> that'd be awesome. I just need it. If I could get there, it would be amazing. The problem is the same study, people that made $100,000 a year said if I could just get two hundred grand, I would be happy. It comes to, like, uh, it comes to all of us, it is, there's so much to be said about our lives and this. I'll give you some examples of me. There was one time in my life that I weighed 295 pounds. I was like Elvis right before he died. I'm talking... 
Thank you. Pastor Speaker, that pecan pie. You know, I mean, I was right there. Um, and I looked at myself in the mirror. I have pictures. I'm too embarrassed to show them. I typically just show you everything, but I'm too embarrassed to show I mean, these people are like, woo, who is that? Um, and I started to look in the mirror after eating Buddy's barbecue for like three years and say, you know what? Um, you need to lose a little bit of weight. It's going to make a difference. And it started in my, in my, as I started this journey, the Atkins diet journey, some of y'all remember that, I kept saying, if I could just get to a certain amount of weight, everything's going to be awesome. I lost 80 pounds. I got to 220. 219 was like my low. Today, I'm like 234, 235. I need to lose that another 15 pounds. But Anyway, um, I got to 220, and I looked at myself in the mirror, and I thought, I got to lose more, right? Me, personally, I'll just be honest with you. Um, I, I felt like when we, we started this church, and uh, we, we got into this building, and we started to grow. I thought to myself, if we could just get 1,000 people, oh, my God, I'm just going to die. It's going to be unbelievable. I don't even know what we'll do. It'll be Shangri-La. It'll be, it'll be, all of my questions will be answered. Today, I'm like, man, we got to have 2,500 people. We're way past 1,000. We're almost to 2,000. It's not the answer. It's not into me. It's not into what you and I strive for and we, we like scheme for and dream. And I mean, where is the answer that we're, we're looking for? And the Apostle Paul talks about it directly to us in God's Word in Philippians chapter 4. And if you have your Bible, turn to that today because we're going to dissect this verse of Scripture. Because a lot of us are struggling today more than ever before to understand what contentment is and what it isn't. You want to write this down, contentment defined as feeling or showing satisfaction with one's possession, status, or situations. Feeling or showing satisfaction with one's possessions, status, or situations. I like this quote. I didn't use it all the services. I'll use it this one. It's a rare person who, when his cup frequently runs over, can give thanks to God instead of complaining about the limited size of his mug. And there's a lot of us today, you say, well, Brent, what is contentment? Am I just supposed to sit here and do nothing? And that, that's great. That sounds good. That's what I'll, I'm just content with everything. No, the Bible says that we are to grow. We're to get after it. We're to further our education. We're to further our family. We're to further our careers. We're to, to be men and women that can, can be blessed. Why? So we can be a blessing to others. But unless you get the secret of contentment down, unless you start where you need to start with and reprioritize your life, you will chase after the wind. It will never be enough. It will never be enough. And we just have to refocus. We have to reprioritize because a lot of us are like my family. You know, a lot of us today, we just don't understand the blessing that we have around us. We don't understand what life is really all about. We're chasing after what the world tells us. So I want, to, I want you to do me a favor as we kind of dig into the, this message. I want you to close your eyes for just a minute. And I need you to answer this question in your life. I need you to, at least this statement, be confronted with this statement. Because this is where it's at. If you can take this statement I'm giving you, and you can put it into your life, and you can refocus on this statement every day, then I have one in this message today. It can make a difference to all of us. Here's what you got to do, and you mentally got to add all this stuff up in your head. Add up everything that you have in your life that money cannot buy you, and death cannot steal from you. With your eyes closed, you're like, this is awkward. Just, just close them. Just think about it. Add up in your mind all the stuff that you have, all the stuff that you obsess over. Add up everything in your life. And here's how you're going to get to the secret of contentment. Add all, uh, all, all this up. What do I have in my life that money cannot buy me and death can't steal from me? Okay, now you can look at me. It's crazy. You're like, oh my God, that's not a lot. You're right. It really comes down to a relationship. And it's only with Jesus Christ. You see, because I kind of sucker punched you guys a while ago. We did a song for the offering called Give Me That Old Time Religion. How many people like that, that, that song? How many people are like, oh, this feels good. But like I'm at country tonight. This is awesome. I mean, it's good. Okay, here's what I'll say. Um, that is the dumbest theologically written song I've ever heard in my entire life. And that was the number two most popular Christian song in the 1950s. Don't you love that? Well, I guess it's good enough for my mom and dad, so it's got to be good enough for me. 
It's going to get me all to heaven. No, religion is going to send you to hell. You realize the most discontent people alive today are sitting in the pews of the church? Because we put it all about us. We think it's all about what we've earned, what we can accomplish, what we can do. And so we sit in here and go, you know what, that music's too loud. As a matter of fact, last night during the 50s medley, um, I, I didn't see it. I was backstage, but I heard from several reports that a family, first time visiting, walked in the door. Jonathan started doing his little pelvic whatever. <laughs> they got up, and they were gone. Because it's like, well, wait a minute, what, what, what's this for me? I don't, I don't understand all this. Listen, if you're going after possessions, if you're going after religion, if you're going after relationships, if you're going after statuses, if you're thinking your circumstances will bring you contentment, you will be chasing the wind. You will never be content in your entire life. You will be the most miserable, discontent people. All the while, you walk down destructive roads. You say, well, nah, come on, everybody knows that. If we're honest... I mean, all of us know that, right? We go, to, we go buy the latest and greatest. It's great for a minute. And, and then you want that, the next latest and greatest like two months later and the world's getting, it's ratcheting it up. Everything's like escalating. It's like, come on, Apple, give me a break. iPad, iPad 2, the iPad HD. What's different about the 2 or the HD? Nothing. But I only have the 2. My life is just not fulfilled. Have you ever gone to the Apple store at West Town Mall? People are like, oh my goodness. It's like a fraction thinner. That will be the answer to my world. We, we laugh, but we live there. A lot of us think the grass is greener on somebody else's septic tank. We do. We do, right? I mean, we do. We seriously are like, you know what? My, my husband, he's just not doing it for me no more. I just read Fifty Shades of Grey, and I, I just don't know what to think about it. And I just, it feeds into where we all live, and it's infiltrated the church. And the Apostle Paul, a long time ago in, in God's Word, says, hey, you know what? I've learned to be content. And when, when God's Word says something, I, I believe more than ever, we need to be listening. And not only hear, but we need to do. And this is what it says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Classic verse of scripture, we, we're so familiar with it, I will say this, we dishonor this verse anymore. Dishonor, remember, too common, too familiar, go through the motions. The Apostle Paul, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Underline that, it's not inherent, it's not given to you, you're just not going to know how to be content. You've got to learn it. You've got to live on it, you've got to understand it. It's not the hearing of the word, it's the doing. I have learned to be content Whatever the circumstances, I need to be in need. How many people know what it is to be in need? We all know that. Okay, keep, keep reading. I, have, I know what it is to have plenty. How many of you have plenty? Keep your hands raised. We need to identify you. There's a camera. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> let's be honest. How many know what it means to have plenty, but then you lost it all? Dumb decision or the stock market, whatever, and now you know what it is to be in need. A lot of us. So, circumstances. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Oh, come on, Paul. Tell me, bro. Tell me. I need to know this. Whether fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, Philippians 4.13, a very classic Bible verse, a lot of our life verses, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Okay, so what is Paul saying here? Let's, let's, let's honor this, this passage of Scripture for a few minutes. Paul's saying this, and think about it. He's saying, how do we learn contentment? And then he gives us how we learn. We learn through circumstances. That's how we learn in life. We learn through circumstances. Things come, things go. We grow old. We get, we get weary. Sometimes we're hungry. Sometimes we're fed. I stood before my wife in a marriage ceremony, and I said, honey, for rich or poor, in sickness or in health, baby, whether we have nothing in the bank and for years, we ate juju beads. I mean, that's all we had. We had nothing. I mean, we just, oh my goodness. And sometimes you're throwing up on both ends. You're sick. I mean, there's stuff going on. Right? I made a commitment to stand before my wife to, to know that it's going to be through circumstances that we will grow. Life is not always the same. You've got to kind of work together. Rich or poor, sickness or in health. The Apostle Paul is saying, hey, you're going to learn through your circumstances a couple of things. You're going to learn, and I just want you to kind of dwell on this for a minute. 
He's like, I'll leave it up to others to be discontent. That's cool. But for me, I'm going to learn through circumstances. I'm going to learn by the teaching of God's word. As I live my life and as I experience my life, I'm going to learn the teaching of God's word, that I'm going to deal with God's providence. That's what he's saying. Hey, that God is in control. And I'm going to allow God to illuminate my circumstances. I'm going to look through God's eyes. I'm going to allow him to illuminate my circumstances. And that Paul was able to see his experiences in life as from the hand of God. And the problem, and this is what I think, and just write this down. As I look at this verse of scripture, the problem is not with the word contentment. The problem is we look for it in all the wrong places. The problem is we look at the word contentment and we think, well, we're supposed to status quo. That, that's not what that word means at all. To be satisfied in your own skin, to put your head on your pillow at night, and to understand who that you are identified with. Who is, is all about your life. To understand the answer is anchored in a foundational, I mean, just a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you know that's who you are and you understand what he has done in your life, you don't have to chase after so many temporal situations, relationships, possessions to try to fill the void. That Christ Jesus, because of his blood, has filled that void in your life. The Bible puts it another way. When we seek Jesus Christ first and his kingdom, then everything else takes care of itself. But we can live each and every day content. That's what I want in my life. I mean, I can be the most discontent person. I'm telling you. I struggle with that. And I think I really believe I have to go back and reset my mind to God's word. To understand this. Listen to this. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. Paul says this. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Think about that. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of the world. Money and possessions cannot do anything for us in eternity. Everyone will leave the world empty-handed. So the only thing you can think about this morning, and what I want you to think about is this. What do I have in my life that money cannot buy me and death can't steal from me? Jesus says it in John 15, 5. Jesus is talking. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. He will be fulfilled. He will have peace in the midst of a storm. Peace that passes understanding. Apart from me, Jesus says, say it with me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So back to Philippians 4.13. I can do everything through Jesus Christ who gives me strength. The problem is we're misusing that verse of scripture because we're trying to make it all about us. Look at what I can do. I can do all things. I'm going to fly. I believe I can fly. I mean, think about it. It's like we're some superhuman hero. Look at me, man. I can do it all. No. The most literal translation is this. And write this down when you think of this verse of Scripture. I have the strength for all things in my life through Jesus Christ. So here's the commentary. By virtue of my relationship with Him alone, because of my living relationship with Christ, and my identity in Him, I have the power to do something I otherwise would not be able to do. Now listen to what you can do with Christ's power. You can be content when things are good or when things are bad. And here's what Paul's saying, and this is all about my life. I want to answer this question. Paul says, you know what? Changing circumstances do not affect my contentment. I really wish I could say that. When we know who we are in Christ, and some of you, you need to deal with that today. The chasing stops. If we look for happiness in this life, you know a lot of us, we, we, you just understand it, we'll never find it. If you look for happiness, you'll never find it. It's like if you ever lost your car keys before, and you're looking all through the house, and you find something that you, oh, I can't believe I found the clicker to my 1984 JVCT, I mean, it's like today people are looking for happiness. And you realize that happiness is just a byproduct of a well-lived life. When you put your strength, your hope, your longing, your possession in, in Jesus Christ, God's Son. It's more than happiness, it's joy. I've been there. I mean, I know. When my wife and I were wallowing in debt... 
It seemed like all we wanted to do was go spend more money. Because that was going to make us happy. And we got into a more destructive pattern. And it's taken us years to understand. You know what? When you walk down through the mall, you can look. But you know what? That itch. And I don't know how to explain it any other way. Some of us know there's like an itch. We get an itch. I got to buy something. It's going to make me feel better. Some of you husbands, your wife, that's got to buy. Honey, if I go buy, it's on sale. It'll make me feel better. If we would just chase after our relationship, if we were just a man or woman that followed after Christ and at the end of the day put our identity in Him, and yeah, God would give us that abundant life, not only for eternity but for now, but to know that our identity is in Him, that we don't have to buy something or we don't have to chase after a relationship to really bring us to a point of contentment because we never find that in temporary things, but to find it in Jesus Christ alone. And we have that. And I don't understand why we, we don't, for all that we have and all that we are as, as an individual and as a family, chase after Jesus Christ all the days of our life. Spend our days obsessing over this relationship we have with Christ and, and what we can't what we can't do to earn it. I mean, money can't buy our salvation. Jesus Christ gave it to us, but to know more than ever before, because of what he's done in our lives, death cannot steal that from us. We have joy. We can bless his name in the good times and in the bad. I like this, and this is what I want said about my life. Paul was content because he could see life from God's point of view. He focused on what he was supposed to do, and not what he felt he should have. So that last question. And then we'll, we're going to read Colossians is this. What does discontentment really say about us? What does it say about our faith? What does it say today? Seriously let's just throw the cards on the table. A lot of us are in the same boat here. What does it say today that we are the most discontent people on earth? That a lot of us chase and we're, we're looking for some future um, experience that's going to bring us happiness. Do you realize God is not worried about the future experience in your life? He's bringing you joy and happiness today if you will rest in Him and rely on His power and understand His providence, that He is in control. And to really think about this a lot, be preoccupied with the well-being of others. Do you realize if we would, and I wrote it down this way, and you might want to write this down somewhere, it's not on your outline, steps to be willing to learn how to be content, if we will learn to give thanks in all things. Number two, if we would learn to rest in God's providence, that He is in control, if we would learn to rely on the power of God and His provision for our lives, if we would learn to become preoccupied with the well-being of others, do you realize that is a recipe for contentment? But today, more than ever, people don't give thanks. Today, more than ever, people don't rest in God's providence because we look around our crazy world and we say, well, God, I'm not sure you're in control. Um, we don't rely on God's power. We try to do it on our own. And more than ever before, we are preoccupied with ourselves. And let me tell you, I'm learning just like you. I'm learning. And the more I give my life and lay my life down and say, God, fill me through Jesus Christ, your son. I don't want it to be about me. You know what? Those are the days that I put my head on my pillow at night and say, God, I know now that happiness is not in some destination on this earth. Happiness is in the journey. And I know what I'm supposed to do. And today I did it to the very best of my ability. And I'm so grateful to have the opportunity. You see, because I know, here's what I know that God wants me to do. And I want to I read, get your Bibles, Colossians 1, chapter 9. Because I want to I leave you with something that I need you to memorize by next week. It's three verses of scripture. We're going to have people at the doors when you walk in. You'll need to have it by memory or you can't come to church next week. Okay, um, it's proactive. That's a joke, by the way, big time. Um, but I want to leave you with something because I believe this verse of Scripture, if we could dwell on this, and this is my prayer for you, this would be like mammoth. We could really reset and reprioritize this idea of contentment in our lives. But before we do that, I just, there's some things I wrote down. I know this is, this, is, this is who I'm supposed to be through Jesus Christ, God's Son. I know I'm called to be a follower of Christ. I know I'm to lead my home to be the best husband and father I can possibly be. I know I'm to be a good steward, that God owns it all. And I look to my life and the things that I have and what I do with it um, as stewardship. God, you own it all. 
let me be blessed to be a blessing. I know that God has called me to an abundant life. That I just, I just know it. I know that God is calling me every day to show the life of Christ to a lost and dying world by how I live my life. And not having to chase, chase the wind of contentment. And here's my prayer for you. I like this. If, what, what would happen if we lived out this prayer? Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. And listen, here's our circumstances. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all His glorious power so you will have the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy. I didn't say happiness because happiness is temporary. May you be filled with joy. Joy transcends happiness. Always thanking God, the Father, He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to His people who live in the light of Christ. Here's how I'm a discontent person. And this is what I'm working on. Last year I took my family. We had an opportunity to go on a trip to Colorado to go snow skiing. First time we've ever done that. My whole family are skiers. My son and daughter learned to snow ski when they were two years old. And I really started to think because I was failing my family. On our way home, the only thing we could think about on the plane, we didn't talk about how, what an epic time it was while we were there. It snowed 30 inches, champagne powder. I mean, it was amazing. I mean, we skied in powder knee deep through trees. I mean, it's like heaven on earth. And we're not thinking, oh, man, how awesome this was. The only thing I was saying to my kids, and my kids are just like me, and that's a big problem. I'm like, well, I guess we can never really go back to Ober Gatlinburg and ski the armpit ski area of America. <laughs> that's all I was thinking. That's all we said. Miranda, you're sitting over right? You're worse than me, so I taught you. That's all. You ever take your wife on a date? My wife and I love to go on dates. We like to go to Turkey Creek or West Knoxville. We like to eat at Carrabba's. Every once in a while, anniversaries, whatever, we go to Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. <laughs> unbelievable and we sit there and go well we'll never eat it be, it be able to eat golden crow again That's... you think about how discontent we really are and we fail to look around at what we have we fail to look around at the salvation we have in Jesus Christ that money could not buy us all the money in the world we couldn't earn it but death can't steal it from us. We look around at home. We look around in the place in which we live. We look around at loved ones, memories that we make, that money really can't buy and death can't steal from those of us that will remember. You know, for those of us in this room, you can identify this way. It's like, we have such an incredible place to live. And I thought about it the other day. We're, we're so discontent. We had a national championship football team in 1998, and now we're, we're not even, if, they're, if they win ten, nine wins this year, we'll still have people wanting the coach fired, and it's just not good enough. That's just our mentality. The other day I was praying that Colossians prayer, saying, God, you know what? I just want to know your will more. I want more understanding spiritually. I want to grow. I want to grow. I, I, I'm not settling. I believe in greater things. I believe this church will go to a whole nother level. And you know what? I used to think if we got to a thousand, I would be happy. And you know what? I don't think anymore of that. P people say, well, Brent, if we go down to South Knoxville, and by the way, that's looking super good. I'll explain that in a few more weeks. If we go down there and we just see this church go to a whole nother level, brother, is it going to be awesome? No, it's just going to be more responsibility. But it's what we're supposed to do. So as we journey together, and we get preoccupied with others and say, hey, we want to show the love of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. As a church, we can know that we are in the arms of God doing what we should be doing. And not just saying, well, we don't have this or we don't have that. Or it's too hot, the music's too loud. Or it's this. Hey, you know what? We're worshiping the God of the universe. The opportunity we have each and every week to hear his word and reset our lives to that is amazing. I sat in my chair the other day. A lot of you know where I live. And I'm lucky because I can look out my front window and there's just like a big field across the street. Cows graze. Mm. They're probably choking on golf balls that I've hit over into that field. 
And I started to kind of list things down and how much I love this community. I love you. How my heart is broken for Sevier County. I love living in Sevier County. I love it. And I looked outside. It was a pretty day. And, and I looked at the landscape of God's creation. And you know what was so cool is I was thinking about that. My wife turned in the driveway. My daughter was, was, I believe, downstairs. My wife had picked up my son. And they were all walking up into the house. And I'm thinking, my whole family is underneath this roof. And my dog was on my lap. And I'm like, God, thank you so much. Don't let me be a guy that gets so preoccupied with the latest and greatest and have to do this and chase this and do that to know that my salvation is secure in Jesus Christ. And as I lead my home and understand that and look to what I have, these are priceless things. I can be a man of satisfaction to know that I am who I am because of you, Jesus Christ, and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing as I follow Jesus Christ all the days of my life. Don't be so discontent because we are. With heads bowed and eyes closed, we're going to close the service this way.